guys, it's D. How are you guys doing today? So today I wanted to talk about some of the things that keep us in pain, like besides the obvious like rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. So that is kind of what's been on my mind for the past week. Um, so I did talk about some of these things already in a post that I wrote earlier, um, but I did want to start out with one that I didn't mention that, you know, really kind of made me think, okay, so I always, I'm, I always like to learn, so I'm always taking classes and stuff, right? So there's this one that um, was on Udemy and I got it on sale. You know, if you ever go and get your courses on Udemy, you know, wait for them for them sales when they're like ten dollars. OK, like, yes. OK. And then there's this one that um, went over. It was like a happiness coach class. Um, and I decided to take it because I wanted to see, like, what is other people's perspectives on happiness? You know, I had my own idea, which is fine. But, you know, like, when you've been through trauma, like, if you've been a survivor of trauma, you learn a lot of stuff that's not normal, okay? So, like, what I thought was, like, love was... Eh, it was modeled in two different ways. One was healthy, one was not. And sometimes I would confuse the two, for example. So I wanted to know what is happiness? You know, because that's something that you can easily learn the wrong thing from at home. Not that people are just like, yeah, I'm gonna teach you the wrong thing. But more along the lines of that's what they know. You know, your parents, your teachers, your community can only teach you what they know. And, um, one of the reasons why I love that we have the internet, okay? And one of the other reasons why I love taking courses because it gives me a perspective that may not be out in the community. I can learn stuff from various other people from different backgrounds. So, rant aside, <laughs> there is this one thing that they had mentioned in this one video and they said that a lot of people don't live authentically. And you know, that made me go and think, and I'm like, well, shoot. Yeah, I remember that time when I was a teenager and in college, you know, trying to find myself and adjust to a real world out there, you know, outside of the little bubble that was home. You know, I did a lot of things to try and fit in or to try and get some sort of experience, you know, and I, I found that even though I'm like, I like this, on the other hand, I felt depressed and I like was not happy with myself and I'm like, why, you know, and I found that I ended up putting myself in a box, like the set box, I had to do X, Y, Z. And, you know, sometimes it didn't mesh with what, like, I really wanted to do, like, in my spirit, at my core, you know, because sometimes your mind thinks it wants something, but you at your core, you're not really feeling it, you know, that's, that's, that's where intuition comes from. And so, I see the difference now between like how I was and how I lived back then when I wasn't being my full authentic self compared to now. And it has been a years long journey to get to that point. Okay, there is no quick fix uh, to be learning how to be your authentic self and doing and saying things because that's how you truly feel, not because you're putting someone else first or not because you're supposed to or I should say this um I want to tell you something that I learned when I had a rough episode um mentally uh earlier last year um, when I was in a program and one of the things that my therapist said is should is shame and that has been really like eye-opening for me. Anytime I said, 
I should be doing this or I should be in graduate school. I should be going for this degree. I should be booking up my calendar to the max. That is telling myself that's not me. And since I'm not doing it, that's not really at my core what I want. You know, and it could be just in one small, well, not small, but one area of your life too, that it was just really eye-opening for me. Um, I initially had it set in a box, okay? I was going to go to nurse practitioner school and I was going to go and work as a cardiac ICU nurse practitioner and I was going to stay in the critical care setting. And, you know, this was all before I got RA and fibro. And I found that, you know, when my body was like, lady, you can't do them 12 hour shifts no more. You can't be on your feet all the time anymore. You can't be lifting people like you could, okay? We need to go and sit down, we need to tone down. Uh, I was distraught. <laughs> I, I was just like, I felt like that was like not what I should, like this is what I should be doing. And I felt a lot of guilt about that. And so, interestingly enough, when I did get rheumatoid arthritis initially, I got really interested in rheumatology. And I was like, this is really interesting. And I was like, really passionate about it. So then I went and seeked out a job in a rheumatology clinic. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I love this. And I loved working with, um, the patients, their families, my colleagues. Uh, my experience as a nurse was actually in the pediatric realm. So I ended up having conversations with a lot of parents along with teenagers and, you know, um, uh, the, the kiddos who are like in that transition period, you know, where they're like at college age, you know, but they're, they're making that transition to being their own person. And I was like, I like this. And there were a lot of questions that people had when they were new, you know, when their child was new to this room, like some of them didn't even know why they were being referred to rheumatology. And I'm like, I could see a light light up in my face when I was talking to them and explaining um, a lot of the things to them, but not from just a nurse who works there's perspective, but also as a fellow person with rheumatoid arthritis, because most of the kiddos had either lupus or um, they call it JIA now, but it's basically juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it shows up a little bit differently in that one because there are like six subtypes, but I am rambling, okay? Authenticity is key. And one of the first ways I found a part of my authentic self in my work was starting my YouTube channel. I wanted to help other people who, you know, didn't have easy access, you know, or people who, you know, it's hard to go and get a hold of their providers or they have to drive hours or go to different states just to get seen. And I know a lot of us, you know, it takes a long time to get diagnosed too. So I just, I loved it. And I found the more that I did with, the channel, you know, with this Facebook group and just navigating my own journey with fibro and RA, I just, I found an authentic piece of myself within those conditions. So I'm not those conditions, you know, we are not our diseases, we are not our chronic pain. But it was a very transformative thing for me to be able to find my authentic self in that aspect and turn it into something really awesome. So whatever that authentic self looks like for you, I really encourage you to explore it. I encourage you also to talk to a therapist about it because they can they can be a sounding board that doesn't have the bias that family and friends would, you know? And so it, that one was huge. And I think that's the key to happiness and to decreasing some of those extra body pains from just carrying around all that guilt and shame about who you are. You know, no one got time for that. We got enough as it is. So, um, 
that kind of goes into the stress aspect because stress can really throw you into pain um, or at the very least amplify it. At least that's what I've noticed for myself. And it's so hard when you have like chronic pain and then you got, you know, work or trying to take care of yourself or, you know, managing your health, your kids, your cats, your different things, relationships that you have to balance and juggle, you know, like it's so hard sometimes to just take a step back and take that stress of, okay, I have to do this. I have to do this. Oh, this is worrying me. Just put it on a shelf for a little bit because all of that is like literally the weight that you can't see. And uh, I don't know about you, but I am not a bodybuilder. Okay. (laughs) You know, so taking just a couple of minutes just to kind of come back to how you're feeling like in your body, how's your breathing, you know, like, How are your hands feeling right now? Like, how does your skin feel? Something just that small. I don't care if you have to go and spend a couple minutes in the bathroom. Because I've done that when I worked my 12-hour shifts. I would sit in the bathroom and just breathe for a couple minutes. I'm like, okay, no one's going to die for a couple minutes. We can do this. Um, So it's amazing how when you are carrying that stress for so long, you're used to it. You know, it's like the hunchback in Notre Dame. You know, the guy with the hunchback was used to having his back hunched. So it was like second nature to him. But if you or me was kind of like all the way hunched like that, we would really feel it. And it's the same with stress. And the thing is, your body doesn't like stress. So it tries to like communicate that with you. But if you're used to it all the time and you ignore it, your body is going to get your attention in some other way. And pain and fatigue happen to be the one, the two, I can count, the two methods that seem to like really get your attention every time because it forces your body to stop. If you're still ignoring it with this pain level, okay, we're going to bring it up more. Oh, we're going to put it in a new place now. Oh, we're going to have it last longer. Eventually, it's going to get your attention, and then you're going to crash, and people are going to be looking like, what in the world happened to you? And then, I don't know about you guys, but I'd be like, you tell me, we both know. You know? So, stress is huge huge you know and you're adding extra stress if you're not doing something that is truly authentic to you you know so like that mixes in together and then when you're focusing on those unhelpful or those shameful or those stressful thoughts like you're giving it way too much attention you know that's adding even more stress on there You know, if we could go and draw like a visual of how our stress looked like if it was like one of those like weights, like in the old cartoons, you know, that that like would go and like crush the cartoon characters, we would probably be flat as a rock, to be honest. We probably would be like underground, to be honest. I mean, I'm I'm just saying. Um, And you see how like all these negative things can make a very vicious negative cycle. So it makes it easier for you to just stay there, go in the same circle, go deeper, you know, into a depression. But then on the opposite side, the positive opposite to that also creates its own positive cycle, you know. And that's not saying that you just ignore all the negativity or you just never think about anything negative. It's a skill, though, to be able to be like, yeah, I see that thought. Like, it's in my peripheral vision. I see that pen there, but I'm not going to go and pick up that pen. I see it there, but I'm not going to focus on my attention on that pen. I'm going to go and focus my attention on this really awesome food. You know, like, I'm going to focus on my Chick-fil-A that I am enjoying very nicely. You know, or the fresh air from my window. You know, like you can pay it you can you don't have to give it too much power and you know whatever cycle that you're in it forms those habits and then those habits basically reinforce the same thing and the thing is you know even though we're not happy in pain like we're not happy being unhappy or stressed out and all that stuff 
you know, if you live in that space for too long, it becomes your Linus blanket. You know what I'm saying? Like it becomes comfortable. So then when you do initially make those steps to do positive stuff, you know, create new positive, helpful habits, focusing on helpful thoughts. One, it feels alien. Two, it feels scary. And three, you know, it's really normal to be resistant to it at first because it's it's new. It's like stepping into uncharted territory, you know? And it's just, it's very, to me anyway, it was very scary. And when I started changing my negative systems from, you know, the negative, like traumatic experience I've had to the positive ones, oh, I relapsed a couple of times and went right back into my negative system. But you know what? I noticed it. And then I got up and went back. So I didn't stay in there as long. And then I was able to stay in the positive one longer. And then the negative one less. And then the positive one longer. And eventually, like, that just became my new way of looking at things. And I'm telling you, when you combine all of this stuff together, it changes who you are. It really does. And the best part about it is with these different things, you can choose that. You know what I'm saying? You can choose what thoughts you give more attention to than others. You can choose to think positive thoughts. You can choose to think of something that is, at the very least, acknowledging what you're feeling. You know, like, if I'm angry, I don't feel ashamed about it anymore. And I used to for many years. I'm like, no, I'm angry. And then it doesn't stick. Because your emotions are like little kids that want attention. Like, mom, mom, mommy, daddy, grandma, hey. Hi. You know. So these things, while they don't completely erase all of the pain that fibro or rheumatoid arthritis does, they can make a huge difference in terms of whether or not that you choose to amplify your pain or dull it down. And that was the main purpose of this video. So I want to know what you guys' thoughts are on this. I think this is a very, very important aspect of anybody, even if you don't have chronic pain, because even if you don't have like chronic pain physically, okay, you can still have a mental, emotional pain, you know? So it's not just the key to helping with pain and giving yourself more energy. It's also the key to happiness, really. And that's why it's such a huge part of my program with the people that I work with is because that right there is the foundation for you to be able to create the life that you want, to, you know, have the joy that you want, to overcome that pain and take your life back from it. So you're not just sitting there as a shell inside in the passenger seat, just waiting for this painful journey to be over. You know, we can't control everything that happens to us, but we can control what we do about it. So I would love to hear a takeaway from you guys about this video. Um, anything that you guys found insightful, anything you wanted to add. And if you are stuck on trying to get out of that negative cycle or create a more positive cycle with this stuff, you know, definitely I encourage you to schedule a pain taming strategy call with me. And we can go and hash that out and figure it out together. And you will walk away from that call with actual action steps that you can take on your own, like as soon as we get off the call, to start making some better changes in your life. So with that said, guys, I really am glad to have you guys here. I'm glad to talk to you guys. And with that said, I will see you guys later. Bye.